These um, speakers made a heroic effort to track their thoughts, complex as they are, for hoping we can follow. And I'm sure there are people here who did follow those thoughts, and perhaps they sparked questions on your behalf. So we have Alan, Lincoln, and Adam, with Scott uh, backing up here, uh, ready to ask questions you might have. Russ. Well, I'll ask the first one to Alan. We're calling the Book of Mormon the scriptures about God uh, uh, violating the law of ceasing to be God. The question is, can God really violate those laws, or can they only try uh, but still not be able to violate the law? And is it uh, a matter of God crashing in an attempt to violate a law that can't be violated? You probably better come up here uh, for, to be heard. We can't really give a good answer to your question because we're going through the scriptures and interpretation, and that's really all we have in the matter. In the case of Alma, he was talking about salvation and the necessity that just that mercy as provided by the Savior's atonement include repentance. He said that if it did not include repentance, then God would fail to be God. And all I can say is that I, would ex I think my own opinion is that he would not have asked that as a rhetorical question, but as an actual question, that if God tried to have a plan of mercy that did not require on our part repentance, which is the changing of our behavior, then he would cease to be God because the purpose of mercy is to bring us back to God, but we can't come back to God if we have unclean uh, behavior. We have to change our behavior, which is by definition uh, repentance. So I, I, my opinion is I take the question literally that it would be possible for God to fail. Other people I'm sure would have different interpretations. And in the case of Lehi talking about opposition, again, in order for us to grow and mature and to learn from mortality, we have to have opposition, as, as Lehi explained. And if we had a, pl a plan of life or a plan of salvation that did not include opposition, then the purpose of God would be destroyed because we really couldn't achieve the result of becoming like God without having opposition to give us choices to make. The choices began in the Garden of Eden with the, the choice of the fruit. And we have choices in our lives. And without the choices being available, that we can't really learn and grow because we, we just become mere robots. So I, my feeling is that I take the, it literally. I'm sure other people might have a different view. Addressed to any of the three, or all of the three, there's a heavy reliance on natural law that informs each of the uh, presentations. But that was not <coughs> flushed out. Are they making a reference to natural law a la Stoicism, natural law a la Scholasticism, or some construct of their own? And then I have a follow-up question based on how that. All right. Who would like to try what kind of law? I think they're probably thinking of physical law rather than. Briefly. Go ahead. Briefly, in regards to my presentation, I'm making no assumptions about a particular definition of natural law. I'm open to considering how any of those that you mentioned or others that we could talk about would fit into the paradigm not particular. Give a further response to that. Well, the first uh, presenter mentioned that God follows natural laws and exalted beings must be obedient to natural law. Um, if that's the case, does that not entail an implicit Neoplatonic uh, ontology and all the problems that that brings with it? Um, sorry. I, I don't think that necessarily follows unless you believe that there is a first law. There may be an infinite regression of laws in which laws are embedded. Um, some people think infinite regressions aren't. Um, Rational? I disagree, but uh, I, does that answer your question? You want to follow up on anything? If you say that God is um, must be obedient to natural law, is that a coherence argument, or is that or well? Is that a, it, a so, in my presentation where that was mentioned, what I'm doing there is I'm portraying 
a, an interpretation of stuff coming from Mormon scripture, where it talks about, it's DNC 88, talks about there's no space in which there is um, no law, there's law in all space, and it talks about, and there's, and you, if you look in the paper, which will be available on the internet, there's a whole bunch of references to script, passages of scripture where it talks about God working according to law. So I'm, I'm making no necessary assumptions about what the, the authors intended by law. I'm perfectly willing to adopt all kinds of interpretations about what that law might be. Do you want to add something about that? Well, I actually thought uh, Gibbons' t uh, talk yesterday addressed a lot of those ideas, and that the idea of Latter-day Saint concept of God is not necessarily the same as uh, traditional Christianity, that uh, God necessarily must pre-exist or presuppose the universe, um, but that is he, he is a participant and exists in it, and so when I talk about law, I'm really talking about physics. Now, I don't presume to know everything about physics or the, presume that every, anybody on earth knows everything that we know, uh, but it's not necessary. I mean, he, there has to be some governance of interaction. And if he exists in the universe just as we do, he has to be subject to this, those same governances of interactions, whatever they may be. So if you assume that there is this larger substrata of interactions in this metaphysic, where does it exist? And how is it that it, it controls God? And we can still say that God is God, per the standard definition where he's perfect, all-powerful, blah, 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 blah. It, it exists because it has always existed, and there could not be existence. I would not necessarily say that laws, in a, in a materialist sense, there is no other where. There is just the universe. And so it has to exist in the universe. I don't speak of, of laws being something that is has to have a wear. It just is. Then how does it inform physical beings? How does it inform physical beings? Because of its, it, it is, it, it is there. And in, in other words, you can't have law, or you can't have interactions if there isn't, isn't some way of governing those interactions. And so the, uh, the contrary of your question would be, how could it be otherwise? Yeah. This sounds like a conversation we'll have to go on over lunch. <laughs> Lloyd. There seems, there seems to be a bit of confusion when you talk about natural laws as governing uh, material or, or God being obedient to natural laws. Because natural laws, I, if, I, if I said, okay, I want to go outside and violate the law of gravity, you know, we'd be, we'd be kind of confusing. But what do you mean by violating the law of gravity? Because Wittgenstein makes a point where he says, well, when we talk about natural laws, we're not saying, we're not saying that natural laws govern the world. Natural laws are what we use to describe the world. Exactly. And so it seems it seems to be kind of nonsensical to talk about God violating natural laws because, I mean, what, what would it look like to violate natural laws? This doesn't seem to make any sense to talk about that kind of notion. I'm not a physicist, but I am a computer programmer. And in computer programming, you can create um, physics engines, like in the virtual world Second Life. And those physics engines may allow humans to fly, which doesn't work very well in our world. Um, and you can have those physics engines embedded in our world where the objects behave differently. Um, so when, when I, I, none, the, the physics engine in the embedded world doesn't violate any physics laws of our world, and if you want to talk about natural laws as being the way we describe the world, then there would be natural laws that are different in those two worlds. The, the denizens of a virtual world would describe their natural laws differently than we describe our natural laws. But also going back to this question here just momentarily, um, the God that I worship personally, I'm not going to speak for anyone else, doesn't necessarily even know the answer to your question. And I'm okay with that. I, I, I'm okay with finite gods. Yes. This question is for Alan. And Alan, I think you said, and it sort of follows up, that um, uh, you know, the God has to abide by the God has to abide by natural law, and that you also said that some, I think you said that uh, somewhere someone had printed a conclusion that at the other end of the universe, the laws of physics and gravity and all that are the same as they are here. We have, yes, two questions, how do we know? I mean, how can you measure that, that all the rules of interaction that we have here really are the same, 80 billion light years from here? And number two, um, I, I guess I, and it's really a fault, I don't understand why 
we couldn't, if God, why God can't create virtual world, then why this itself is in the virtual rule, and that God has set the rules just as Lincoln would set the rules when he set it up in virtual, you know, second life or something like that. Why, why, you know, why God couldn't change the rules and, and create another universe to create this universe differently? The statement that I gave concerning natural laws in this world being also those in the uh, galaxy six uh, billion miles uh, light years away was a recent uh, development or advancement in science in which they were able to study the, and I don't know the details because I'm not an astronomer or a physicist, but they were able to study the, the laws that seem to be in effect within this distant galaxy and they were obeying the same type of physical laws that we have in this world. Joseph Smith said that truth is, truth is things as they are, things as they have been, and things as they will be. Yes, God could create a virtual world in which he could have whatever conditions he wanted, just as with Second Life, for example, that we can have virtual worlds that allow us to do things that are not physically possible in this world. But virtual worlds of that type are not reality. They're a creation of some intelligent being, but they're not reality because reality is things as they are, things as they have been, and things as they will be. All we can do is take the scriptures that we have and then again try and interpret them in terms of a consistency among the context within the, the different scriptures. But doesn't that just, I mean, could you say that God did set up the laws? I mean, why, why is it? impossible for God to set up the laws for the universe. And, and, and they are the real laws that we have. Or is that just a saying of creation next to Hillel? I use the term law to refer to the relationships and the conditions that govern matter. Whether it's, we have, we're all aware of the physical laws that are studied by science. I have extrapolated from that into the uh, supposed laws that would uh, govern material matter. Joseph Smith said that spirit is matter. So to me, reality is the existence of matter, whether physical matter or spiritual matter. And we know through science, we're learning through science, the physical laws that control physical matter, and then we extrapolate a similar or a parallel, parallel situation for spiritual laws. The scriptures don't really say that there are spiritual laws. It's a, sort of an extrapolation from our world into the spirit world. So this is reality, is the existence of these elements and the relationships that, between them. In Abraham, we do read that God said, let us go down and take matter and organize our world, which indicates that the matter, I can't really say that it would be pre-existent to God, but it would be at least existence, pre-existent to the creation of our world. And that the, the laws would be the laws that govern that matter. Whether the, if God wanted to create a, a virtual world of his, uh, with different laws, he could do that. But the virtual world would not be reality in the terms of actual elements that exist. It would be just a fabrication through software or whatever the media might be that would, would be used. But to me, reality is the existence of real elements and real laws that control the relationships between those elements. Anything else is not reality. Sure, this is for Adam about agency. Um, in the Doctrine and Covenants, it talks about agency being a matter of accepting or rejecting light. And then coupling that with the LDS concept of the light of Christ that fills the immensity of space, I'm wondering if you could just, or if you have played around with the idea of light or light of Christ being information that's embedded. I mean, as you're talking about quantum, you're saying that it allows information to be imposed onto waveforms. There's some correlate that you've played with in that respect. I've read section 93 many times and I still don't understand everything uh, about it. Um, the light of Christ, in my mind, can't be just you know the photons, the electromagnetic radiation that we, we typically associate with. Um, and so it has to be something more 
and that it's not it's not physically tenable to to, to be just that. Um, and it may well be something that helps assemble the information so that we get the simultaneous interaction with the information that we need. Uh, I think that's a really good idea. Um, how to make it into an observable would be a would be a real intriguing problem and question. I don't know if that answers what you're thinking about. But ultimately, I don't know a whole lot about what Section 93 is talking about. Wish I did. Is that you back there, Christine? Yeah, me. Um, this is Brad. Um, you were talking about uh, detecting intelligent matter, and um, I wanted to know what you or, or anyone else does with the dawning realization that some huge fraction of the matter in our universe is dark or essentially opaque to us, and that you know most of the real numbers we know about are uncomputable. Um, how do you sustain sort of technological optimism in the face of, of the awareness of those limits? Why not give up and write novels? So what she's, <laughs> what she's, what she's talking about is that 95% of the universe that we observe is, is some kind of stuff that we have no idea what it is. Uh, some 30% of it is dark matter, which is a matter that we don't know what it is. And then the other stuff is, is dark energy, which is we don't even know what it isn't. And, uh, and it doesn't behave anything like matter that we know of. Now, I don't know a, uh, a, an LDS physicist who hasn't thought, oh, maybe dark matter, spirit matter. Um, and so that, and that is an intriguing idea, and it has a lot of appeal. Uh, but it's something that has to be looked at very, very carefully. Uh, for example, we don't know if spirit matter has the possibility of interacting gravitationally, which is the defining characteristic of dark matter. Um, so it's an open-ended question yet for me. In dark energy, well, we just don't know what it is. But it also presupposes that our cosmological model is on the right track. It works well with the model that we're working with, and it works extremely well. Uh, but we also have to face the fact that the idea of something being uncreate, having always existed, doesn't really work, doesn't really mesh very well, at least to me, with a finite past. We can't have all the intelligent matter in the universe suddenly appear some 13.7 billion years ago. Um, so... But what about Christine's question? Will we ever be able to see this, or are we doomed to blindness to 95% of the universe? Well, I think the answer is yes, eventually. Um, that's a, indeed one of the assurances of the Doctrine and Covenants, is that in the fullness of times, which means pre-millennium, um, all the orders of the, all the planets and stuff will be, will be made known. And so I have great optimism that we'll figure out some stuff. In the back, in the wall. Yeah, there are some points that were being made uh, about artificial intelligence and a problem with uh, intelligence arising out of anything that we can do. But it, it seems that in Mormon doctrine there shouldn't be a conflict between something that is uh, temporarily becoming and yet eternally being. Uh, we have a Christ who is always the Christ, who was always the Christ, who will always be the Christ, but yet had to perform the atonement to be Christ. We have us who can become gods, and yet once we become gods, we are eternal. Um, could it not be that to create artificial intelligence or make artificial intelligence in a computer sense, you're simply organizing matter according to the laws uh, by which intelligence is organized, by which intelligence becomes what it is, and yet once that intelligence is, it will be eternal, just as Christ is eternal, just as we will eternally be God. I'll grant you that uh, our use of the word eternal and stuff like that is a little loose and, and, and so on. Um, but if we want to create what we call a, a true intelligence, it has to come from something that is the cause of itself. And anything that we create will, will necessarily violate that condition. Um, now, if we can somehow incorporate intelligent matter into, let's say, a robot of our own construction, then we could get a true intelligence. Uh, but without the, I don't see any way around the philosophical argument that. I think organizing, if we can organize it according to the laws of intelligence, what makes an intelligence an intelligence? It's not so much creating it from scratch, but it's, it's organizing it into. Yeah. Um, one of the ideas that I, that I hold is that uh, intelligent matter in and of itself isn't necessarily intelligent. It isn't necessarily what we'd call an intelligence, but that we didn't really become an entity in the way that we think of an entity until we had a spirit body assembled around it. And then we became the intelligences that Abraham talks about. Uh, 
you know, and if we could somehow tap into intelligent matter and manipulate it and, and assemble with it a body to go with it, then yes, we could make true intelligence. But in our present condition, none of our technology allows us to do that. One more question right here. Yeah, Robert, this is for Lincoln. Uh, Lincoln, should the LDS Church embrace and officially, kind of officially embrace and teach technical innovation? <laughs> Not a specific one, no, but we should be officially, in my opinion, endorsing the value of science and technology. And I think we do to some extent, but we can do it a lot more strongly. Well, we've come to the point uh, where we're going to split for just uh, an hour for lunch. Um, we're going to split in the sense that there are various paths we can take. We have meeting with us today the LDS Council, which is the sponsor of this entire program. And they are going to go down the walk over to the Johnson boardroom. If you want to go out down the stairs and into the parking lot and down. And if you will hasten over, there's lots of work that Joe Bentley has for you. Um, for others, um, Claudia tells me there are lunches outside. We're not exactly sure we have enough lunches for everybody because we have no idea how we're coming. So we have preserved 15 lunches for the participants because we don't want the rest of you greedy people eating up their lunch when they're the ones who did all the work. So you can go and uh, if you're delayed here, there will be a lunch reserved for you in room 110. And for the others, um, you're welcome to take a box lunch and enjoy yourselves. If you want to get away from all this for a while, if you go south, we're on the equivalent of 9th Street. If you get down to 3rd Street on Harvard or Yale, you'll find a multitude of, of uh, very attractive restaurants that I think you will enjoy. So go south and to the right, and you'll be there. So then we'll come back, convene once again, uh, shortly after one o'clock. So thank you for all who <laughs> attended this morning. <laughs>